Hi everyone, Carl Steele here, English 4113, 13th class. This is about John Hawksworth's adaptation of Offer Ben's novel, Orinoco. His play is, of course, has the same name, Orinoco. Uh, within about 15 years of Offer Ben's uh, publishing Orinoco and her death, we have an adaptation for the stage of the novel by a man named Southern. Uh, that version has both the Orinoco and Emelinda plot, and also a secondary plot, which is kind of a romance plot between rich white people, and it's a comedy. So there's a sort of a comedy and tragedy side by side in this play, and that's what Hawksworth aims to eliminate in his version. Um, Southern has already turned Emelinda white. Here's an image of an actress from 1791 playing the role, and maybe our presenters will talk about what's going on with that today. We'll certainly get a chance to talk about it in class. But the main thing that Hawksworth wants to do is just to make it a straight up tragedy. He's not the only person in that decade to adapt uh, the, the novel. There are actually three adaptations just in the, that decade alone. So people really want to bring off Ben's novel back to the stage. Hawksworth is just simply the one that's the most well known and is the most financially successful of those three plays. So what does he do to it? Well, I've got an incomplete list and I'm just gonna talk you through some of the key changes. First off, of course, um, we can pay attention to just what's preserved. There's not a lot left of the original novel in here. That's partially the blame on Southern himself, but Hawksworth could have added that back in if he liked. So uh, the attitude towards the captain is something that Hawksworth has in his play. Offer Ben is very down on him and quite negative. Hawksworth is as well. This is the person who kidnaps Orinoco in the first place. Of course, Hawksworth takes the extra step of actually having Orinoco kill him, which is something that Offer Ben doesn't allow her character to do. The other major change, of course, is that it's a play at all. It's a five-act tragedy. And while some critics really want to stress that there is a kind of ironic distance between Offer Ben and her narrator, um, and they say all the kind of political confusion and confusions of sympathy in the novel are due to some kind of ironic distance between Offer Ben and the first person narrator of that novel. I don't really think that's the case, frankly. I think Offer Ben's political commitments are quite confused. And that one of the things about that novel is there's really not a lot of ironic distance between the first person I and, uh, and the writer. However, with a the play, there's no necessarily particular point of view. It's a bunch of characters on stage. And that itself is going to make a major change in how it is we appreciate and engage with this text. So I'd like you to think about that. Um, of course, it begins in Suriname itself. We have no images of African glory of Orinoco as a very highly respected prince back in his native land. Uh, his grandfather here made his father never appears. And we don't have the kind of acts of war and where Orinoco can, sh show, can show his martial heroism. That just is completely absent from it. We begin, in fact, with the planters waiting the arrival of slaves and talking about these enslaved people. And from the very beginning, they're talking about breeding. They're very concerned about, about reproduction <coughs> and, and the idea that enslaved women are going to bear children who are themselves going to be born enslaved. Um, so that concern, right, which is a thing that drives Orinoco finally to want to rise up and to escape, is there from the very beginning. Offer Ben or buries this quite a ways into the novel, but that's really front and center in this play. And it's something that you have to keep in mind as you're reading the whole thing. We know, we know what the planters want these enslaved people for and how it is they expect to make money on them eventually, not just through their labor, but through their pregnancies. Um, the natives, there are Native Americans, of course, in Offer Ben's novel. They're very important. And here they have no lines at all. They're simply a dangerous, mysterious force that show up at one point and try to run away with all the enslaved Africans. Uh, and then they're defeated by Orinoco. And then they leave. And that's the last we see of them. Um, so there's no ethnography in this. There's no description of their customs. There's no natural history. There's no sense that Suriname is a particular kind of place. And we can, again, talk about why, why Hawksworth play does this, what's maybe happening in the mid 18th century that makes this text so much more terrified of representing natives on stage uh, compared to how Offer Ben's gonna do it, maybe. Uh, in this version, Orinoco wants to escape as he does in the novel,
but he doesn't want to kill anybody. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. Um, he wants to basically get to the ships and run away. And he's actually betrayed by somebody who claims to want revenge, but all he wants is his individual liberty. So Orinoco has a real sense of loyalty, primarily to Emoenda and to his future progeny, and then to Avalon, who makes an appearance in Suriname in this version, unlike in Offer Ben, and then thirdly to the other enslaved Africans, but he's betrayed by one of them, right? So we have uh, additional layers of villainy in Hawksworth's play compared to Offer Ben, where the lines between who's a hero and who's a villain are actually much fuzzier. Um, in this version, Imoenda kills herself and she's the one who's talking Orinoco into killing her. And finally, she just takes the dagger from him, stabs herself, and then Orinoco um, takes responsibility for that. But in this version, it, she's the one who does it. That's also a significant change. And she's white. Again, we'll talk about that in class, I'm hoping. Um, and then there's the question of who else is killed, the white people who are clearly the worst of them. The captain gets killed, the one who betrays Orinoco in the first place, and the governor, the one who is constantly trying to rape Imoenda, uh, he gets killed as well. And then, um, so we have the sense that the whiteness, the white villains can be purged from the society. They can be eliminated. The play has a kind of sentimental, even liberal notion that uh, badness can be um, eliminated from this slave society without eliminating slavery at all, right? Is it actually an abolitionist play? We can talk about that in class. So um, the main thing, I'm one main thing that's really striking to me about this play is that there is, in fact, no rebellion. Of course, there is in Offer Ben's novel, uh, Orinoco leads everyone away, and then there's a little battle, uh, and, and he's defeated. Uh, and then eventually he he leaves, he kills Imoenda, he's, re he's captured again, and he's tortured to death. That's how the novel goes. In this version, Orinoco doesn't want to actually lead a rebellion. He wants to lead an escape. He wants to get people to the ship and then get them on the ship and just go away. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. But I just want to say, well, maybe what, what's going on that would lead Hawksworth to be reluctant to portray that. Again, maybe it's part of Southern's play. I haven't reviewed it recently because it just doesn't look that interesting or good to me. Um, I think Hawksworth's play is actually pretty good. Um, but one thing that happens is that over the course of uh, the English possession of Jamaica, nearly its first century of possession of that, the white planters are constantly be, being harassed by uh, enslaved people who have escaped to the mountains and build their communities up there in the mountains and other places that the white people can reach. And there's constantly battles and fighting between them. Uh, and this goes on for a very long time. And so I'm going to direct your attention to this article, Slavery and Slave Revolts, a Socio-Historical Analysis of the First Maroon War, Jamaica, 1655 to 1740, by the important historian of slavery, Orlando Patterson. So it's an important article. And I think one of the things that's in the background of the playwright and also uh, his audience is the notion that the English uh, slave colonies are places where there are uprisings very frequently. And they're quite afraid of them. You're going to have in 1760, the year after Hawksworth writes his play, uh, Tacky's Revolt, also in Jamaica, which is the most important uprising of the 18th century. It's eventually put down and defeated, but it's going to help inspire the, the Great Revolt in Haiti in the uh, in the early early 19th century. So um, just bear that in mind. Why does Hawksworth leave the rebellion out? And I think it's probably a certain fear of representing that on stage. Then, um, whoops, we have the question of, is this an abolitionist play? And I kind of think it is in the sense of both Ben and Jefferson, the way that they imagine abolition, which isn't really a full on abolition the way that we would want it. Recall that Jefferson in his notes on Virginia, which I have here, is he says, well, what we should do is we should just take all the uh, black people and we should send them away. And we can't have them here. Why can't we have them here? Well, if you pause this slide and reread that, you'll see why. But basically, Jefferson says, it's because if we white people continue to have black people on, among us, they are going to want revenge. And so we need to get them out of here. And then secondarily, because he's a racist, and he says they're not suitable to remain with us. And so we have in this play, Orinoco basically just trying to get back to Africa. This is not a rebellion. It's a kind of like version of abolition that doesn't really go far enough. It's never going to imagine repaying these Black people for their stolen labor and their stolen lives. It's just saying, what if we can just turn back the clock and send them back 
and wash our hands of this whole thing. So there's a certain kind of fantasy here that actually lines up really neatly with none other than that terrible racist Thomas Jefferson. Then in Offer Ben, you recall that Offer Ben is extremely class conscious. The thing that really drives her novel, Isadora Noko, is a prince. It's less so that he's a black man who's being maltreated by white people, but rather that he's a prince who's being maltreated by people who are his inferiors, right? She's a royalist, absolutely. And so um, we have this bit in the play that kind of has that class consciousness where Orinoco says, uh, in this moment when we're about to have a fight between the governor's forces and Orinoco, and uh, the governor offers all of Orinoco's forces pardon, and they all abandon him, and he's just left alone. And he says, let them all go. Now, governor, I see I own the folly of my enterprise, the rashness and the action, and must blush quite through this veil of night, a whitely shame, to think I could design to make those free who were by nature slaves, wretches designed to be their master's dogs and lick their feet. We were too few before for victory, we're still enough to die. And he says that to the remaining people and basically saying, these people are so wretched and so pathetic, you might as well enslave them. So there's this sense that slavery is a justifiable treatment of certain kinds of people and that only if you're a prince or a heroic person, do you really deserve liberty? That really feels like an offer Ben to me. Uh, it's really not a full on abolitionist notion. And again, it's probably because this is a tragedy and the tragedy is not a universal genre, right? The tragedy has to raise one person up above everybody else so it can bring them low. And it does that with Orinoco and it even does it to a certain degree with Inuenda. Okay, last point, if my slides are working. This is just a little bit from a contemporary reception of Hawksworth's play. Hawksworth was close friends with a man named Samuel Johnson, who's one of the most important men of letters in 18th century England. Uh, he was a, a journalist, a, a writer of all sorts. He helped uh, assemble uh, a very important dictionary of the English language. Um, and he was a famously cantankerous man. Um, and he is much keener to read the novel, I think, I mean, to play as an abolitionist work, I think, than even Hawksworth was to write an abolitionist work. So in his review, the critic from the uh, uh, publication called The Critical Review or Annals of Literature, volume eight from 1759, 488 to 86. I'm gonna upload the PowerPoint to Blackboard. You can click on that link if you like. You can see his review and get a sense of what 17th century dramatic criticism looks like to my eye. It all looks extremely vague. It doesn't really feel professional and that's fine, but you know, I'm trained with skills that Samuel Johnson doesn't have uh, for better or for worse. But he decides to concentrate on what Hawksworth did to Southern's play. And he quotes long passages from it to show how Hawksworth has improved it, despite the fact that Southern left him with kind of a, a really crappy play. And what's really striking to me is if you read through uh, Johnson's review of Hawksworth, as he highlights especially passages that are about enslaved people being beaten and maltreated that he's really trying to call attention to the maltreatment of enslaved people. Um, and that's, that's incredibly important to Johnson. And you can already see that he is trying to wrestle the play into being much more abolitionist perhaps than it actually is, just in the same way that Offer Ben's novel, which I don't think is abolitionist at all, is very quickly taken up by abolitionists in the 18th century as something that really helps their cause. Throughout the 18th century, we can see Orinoco as a site of struggle, of people trying to turn the story into something that's not because they need a really good story to combat the entire institution of slavery. And that's all I have for you today, uh, but I'm looking forward to our conversation in class later.